Articles of Faith is a weekly interview show featuring scholars and writers who have written about the doctrines and teachings of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Articles of Faith is a production of Fair Mormon and is hosted by Nick Galetti. Hello, this episode's guest is Kevin Christensen. Kevin Christensen has been a technical writer since 1984. He has a bachelor's in English from San Jose State University. He has published articles in Dialogue, Sunstone, The Farm's Review of Books, the Journal of Book of Mormon Studies, Insights, The Meridian Magazine, including his article in The Interpreter, a Journal of Mormon Scripture, entitled Eye of the Beholder, Law of the Harvest, Observations on the Inevitable Conclusions of the Different Investigative Approaches of Jeremy Runnels and Jeff Lindsay. Kevin comes to us today by phone to discuss that article. Uh, He comes to us from Pennsylvania, is that right? Yeah, I've lived out here for just about nine and a half years. Okay, well, how's the church going out there? Um, Well, there are a couple of stakes in Pittsburgh. We don't have a temple in this area yet. uh, It's coming, right? Yeah, well, (laughs) I know that they would like one very much. (laughs) Uh, There's one out in Philadelphia, but uh, Pittsburgh doesn't, although there's quite a bit of church history in the area. I I understand that uh, Sidney Riggs used to live around here, and we're not very far from Kirtland. Excellent. Just a few hours away. Excellent. Well, that's kind of neat. Well, I guess I'll, you're, you are a technical writer by trade and have been for years, but how would you describe your approach to writing in an LDS context? Well, I just was somebody who just wanted to be informed. The first article that I, that I got published was uh, in Dialogue, and that came about because I had I'd read an earlier article that bothered me for a few days, and it was the resolution of my concerns that uh, I decided you know, to write the essay, and uh, I sent it off to Dialogue, and uh, it took so long for them to get back that I'd forgotten that I'd written it. <laughs> but I, I tweaked it a bit, and that got published. And then uh, a little bit later, then I was reading up on uh, near-death experience research, and I'd read Moody's The Light Beyond, and that got me excited because he mentioned the LDS connection with near-death accounts. And so I read, you know, a dozen or so near-death books, and I saw the connection between Alma's conversion and I unto death. And I did a presentation at Sunstone, and then uh, the Farms Review is starting up, so I wrote it up, and that was in the, published in the second Journal of Book of Mormon Studies. And I periodically would review books uh, or things for the Farms Review, and sometimes just repon- responding in apologetic sense for some things, or like in the case with Margaret Barker, where I'm just seeing something you know, worth getting excited about. Most of your stuff comes from this perspective of you read something and you want to find out the truth of it, so then you kind of organize your thoughts into a responsive article. Well, I've described it like every once in a while a topic will seize me and shake me, and out at the other end comes an article. <laughs> and it's it's been somewhat surprising to me that I've published so much over the years, but you know, it's it just added up. And I've been doing it uh, you know, outside of the academic community since, you know, I'm just, uh, just have my bachelor's degree in English and I work as a tech writer, but uh, for some reason I've been able to fairly regularly get things published. Yeah, well, you actually, you bring up your your articles that deal with temple mysticism and temple theology with respect to Margaret Barker, as you've talked about, and who is a, a Methodist, right, who seems to be yes. making her way into the minds of some LDS scholars, uh, yes, including sir. yourself. So yeah. Fun to be part of that. Yeah. Well, the article that you've you've presented in the interpreter has very little to do with, with the topic of temples. In 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 a sense, what brought about the shift to this topic? Um, well, I participate on the Mormon Dialogue and Discussion Board fairly regularly, and uh, some people started a thread on this essay. And so they posted the links, and I read it. And uh, for you know, <clears throat> this is stuff that I've run across and dealt with before. All of it, it, all old news to me, because I've just been trying to keep informed in Mormon letters, as, as just for my own sake, as something I've been doing since my mission to just be informed. And then when I read something like this and see that some people are struggling with it, and I did a few posts on my approach to the thing, and I, I'm aware that Fair has done a, a detailed response. So, my sort of thing is, <clears throat> rather than do a point-for-point point whack-a-mole kind of thing, is I want to look at what is it that generates the problem in the first place. Yeah. It's, it, because other people have confronted the same information and don't have the same conclusion. 
why the difference? Why can we look at the same thing and have a completely different experience? And ever since you know, some of my first articles in the, in the Farms Review of Books, and especially a long essay I did called uh, Paradigms Crossed, you know, I, I used Thomas Kuhn's idea about paradigms, and I more recently got involved with something called the uh, Perry Scheme for Cognitive and Ethical Growth. But I don't do a lot of that in this essay, but it's, the idea is to, to look at how people look at things. Yeah. And uh, and I refer to the parable of the sower. When Jesus, you know, tells the parable in Mark, you know, the, the disciples listen and they, they kind of go, I, I don't get it. <laughs> right. <laughs> what does it mean? And Jesus says to him, I think it's a, it's a wonderful statement. He says, know ye not this parable? How then shall you know all parables? You know, and so for me that is saying this is a key to everything. If you want to understand how epistemology works, you know, how ontology works, understand the parable of the sower, that the same seed can give you a vastly different harvest, all depending on the soil and the nurture. You know, so if someone gives you a perfectly good seed and you put it on an anvil and start pounding it with a hammer and you start saying, grow, I'm hungry now, <laughs> you're not going to get much of a harvest. Yeah. Well, the title again of the article for those, it, it hasn't been released just yet, but it should be coming out shortly. In the interpreter. Yeah, it'll be on, on a Friday. Okay. Yeah. So the title of the article is, well, it's, it's perhaps a bit verbose, so I guess it serves yeah. as both an abstract and a title. Um, again, yeah. it's called Eye of the Beholder, Law of the Harvest, Observations on the Inevitable Consequences of the Different Investigative Approaches of Jeremy Runnels and Jeff Lindsay. Now, without knowing these two individuals, who are they? Why did you pick them? Uh, why were they the subjects for this article? Well, <laughs> Uh, Jeremy Reynolds is is this uh, he said, describes himself as a disaffected Latter Day Saint, and he is uh, he read an account of a talk in nineteen uh, you know two thousand twelve that said that uh, people were leaving the church because of you know information on the internet. So he was disturbed by that. So he spent a year investigating and managed to lose his testimony over that year of investigations. And his uh, CES director asked him to explain why. So he produced this 83-page uh, document, and then some of his friends said, let's put it on the Internet. So it went out there and apparently went viral. So it, he has his own website now. Now, on the other hand, when I read the essay, I'm aware that Jeff Lindsay is an LDS blogger who has been uh, blogging since uh, 1994 or thereabouts, and he's he's had an extensive LDS fact. And for a while, Lindsay's site was the best LDS apologetic site on the internet. You know, it has since been surpassed by FAIR and, and Max Maxwell Institute, but, you know, for a while, Jeff was a gold standard, and his site is still very good, and uh, it's very extensive, and he has dealt with all of the questions that have bothered Runnels so much, so it just seems to me like, clearly, they're dealing with the same questions, the same information, but where Runnels shatters, Jeff Lindsay demonstrates boundless enthusiasm. So what makes the difference? It's like seeing a rainbow. You have to stand in the right spot and have the light coming through, you know, the, the droplets of water in the sky to be able to see it. So it's a matter of perspective. And it, sometimes it takes time to get yourself into that position. Uh, what I've done myself is I've done three things. Uh, whenever I run it, you know, I, I keep my eyes open, I give things time, and I re-examine my own assumptions every now and then. And the alternative to doing that is to not keep up with things, to insist on final answers now, and to never change your thinking. Um, and those kind of decisions have consequences. You seem to put on a sort of spiritual doctor, or maybe even a spiritual mathematician kind of hat as you write this article. I, I won't call it a, an autopsy or audit of Jeremy Runnell's spiritual journey, uh, but rather an, an analysis or a diagnosis of how one comes to negative conclusions. Yeah, I think diagnosis is a good word. It's, you know, the gnosis is for knowledge. So it's it's figuring out why is it that he's seeing what he's seeing and to understand that. And we can do it with compassion. It's, you know, it's not treating him like a, like an enemy or something, but it's it's understanding, you know, if a person is saying here, I, I'm having a crisis of faith over these reasons, you know, I, I take it for granted that for the most part, the critics of the Church are being honest. And they're saying, this is what I'm seeing. Well, so what I want to do is I understand, okay, why are you seeing that, and why am I seeing this if we're looking at the same things? And it usually has to do with things like background expectations and sources and patience and the ability to 
step into a different framework sometimes. As you know, I, I refer to Thomas Kuhn's book uh, quite a lot in my writings, you know, The Structure of Scientific Revolution, the importance of the paradigm, the framework in which you place the information that you're dealing with, and what can happen if you change that framework. For example, I, one of the examples that I give in the essay is, say, I live in Pittsburgh, and if I say I live, I've lived you know, near Pittsburgh for nine years and I once attended a professional football game. So the image that can come to mind is not Pittsburgh Steelers, Three River Stadium. But that's not true. I have to add a little more context. When I lived in Liverpool, England, I once attended a professional football game. And soccer. that changes everything. Yeah. That's, you know, well, it's a different football game. game. They call it football. They didn't call it soccer. Yeah. You know, that was their word. But it's a different set of rules, a different game, a different style of play, different equipment, and everything changes because of the context. And this is something that you can't know the difference a difference context makes until you've been there, until you've had that experience of stepping into that different framework. So uh, a lot of the, the brittleness that some people have is comes from that inability to shift their perspective. Well, I, I want to actually read a paragraph that kind of is an example of that. Uh, from your from your article, uh, it says, "quote The familiar fable of Henny Penny, also known as Chicken Little, makes a related point. In the fable, a chicken interprets the fall of an acorn as evidence that the sky is falling. Another interpretation of exactly the same event would be, the sky is not falling, but just an acorn. No big deal, no crisis. Acorns fall from oak trees all the time. It's natural and to be expected. Another character." In the more cautionary versions of the fable, Foxy Loxy sees not a crisis or a non-event, but an opportunity to exploit fear and ignorance of his own gain, for his own gain. Same data, different interpretation. The information does not speak for itself, but must be interpreted within an informational context and a conceptual framework, end quote. So this, this is where it echoes your title, The Eye of the Beholder, how we see things and forms our decisions and that sort of thing. But one of the things that you kind of imply with this is that the chicken littles, if you will, their interpretation of the sky falling is not the acorn's fault. It's not nope. the tree's fault. These things just happen naturally. So how yeah. then does this play into viewing the Jeremy Runnels of the world, for that matter, the Jeff Lindsay's as well? Well, Jeff Lindsay doesn't panic. <laughs> if I run across something that I don't expect, the first thing that I should say is, oh, that's interesting. I didn't expect that. I wonder what I should expect. You know, it's to give things time. And uh, to uh, once you give things time, then you can step into another framework that says, "Oh, okay, now I understand that better. I can understand why I didn't understand, you know, why I had the previous experience." And if I reframe my own expectations and I get a little bit more information, then I have can look at the same information and have a very different experience. And if and in you know in my studying of the gospel, you know, since I got real serious in 1974, um, I've had that sense of expansion come many times. And for me, that's the fun of being a member of the church and, and why I like to do scholarship is because I like that feeling of having my mind expand and my understanding increase. You know, and that's a, that's a very interesting conclusion because I know that I've heard a lot of people when they come to the different conclusions, the Runnels conclusions, it's that they're in the enlightened position. And yet here you are saying that you've maintained a faithful position, but yet you're the one that's feeling expanded. How How is it possible that both can have the same response? Uh, well, they they do. So the, what the key to things is, is, which I don't get so much to into, into this, but I have in, uh, in others, is uh, Thomas Kuhn's book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, gets into why is it that you can decide one paradigm is better than another. It's not like, well, you know, uh, all things being equal, you know, whatever interpretation you choose, that's, you know, that's your truth for you. But uh, Kuhn talks about why one paradigm can be preferred, you know, and, and so he, he comes with these values that are not paradigm dependent. It has to do with things like the accuracy of key predictions and the comprehensiveness and the coherence and the fruitfulness of it. Just when you try it, if you start to see things that you never would have seen otherwise, and uh, the simplicity and the aesthetics of it and the fruitfulness of it, if you try it, and if you start to learn things that you never would have seen otherwise, and the future promise. And, you know, I noticed 
what, 20, 20 years ago or so, that uh, what Kuhn is talking about in structure as how you would decide, decide one paradigm is better than another is exactly what ALMA 32 says that you should be looking for. So you try the experiment and you see that this thing works and it expands your mind, you know, which is like you know, the comprehensiveness and the, you start to see the connections between different things that were disconnected before. And you, since you're, you're doing this experiment, you're seeing things that you never would have seen if you hadn't tried it. You know, I gave the experience of uh, this essay that I wrote for Dialogue. Uh, it was published in 1991. If the crisis that I had at that point had destroyed my faith and I just bailed, all of the things that I have written since then never would have happened, and I wouldn't have known what I was missing. You know, now to me that's scary, but also I look at the things you know that have been exciting that I've you know been able to learn from other people, and also sometimes to contribute. There's this excitement of it. So you know, I've learned by experience that you know when I run into something I don't know that you know there are some really really smart people in the church and that have investigated these things, and if I just pay attention, then I'm going to have a lot of answers. You know, I'm going to stand on the shoulders of giants. Yeah. And, uh, and if I do that, then I'm going to see a lot further. And then, you know, over time, just becoming familiar, then every once in a while, I can recognize when I run across something that hasn't been recognized before, you know. So if I contribute the essay on uh, Alma's conversion as a near-death experience, then that's something new, and I find myself being able to give back. Excellent. And uh, that gets exciting, too. Yeah. Well, you you talk about this idea with the mind expanding and coming to know more knowledge than you would have otherwise. It's interesting that you point out that the arguments that were presented in the CES letter, the infamous CES letter, are really old arguments. And it almost seems as if those that have taken an anti-position have progressed very little in finding things wrong with the LDS faith. Now, yeah. you, you, you make an argument in, in your article, or at least you point this out, that there's that people that present complaints on a given topic, such as uh, the veracity of prophets and prophetic teachings, they rarely offer an alternative definition. They simply are there pointing out how we're wrong, not so much mm-hmm. that they're right. Is, is that a fair assumption? Is that how it seems to appear? Yeah, well, he sometimes one of the things that I've noticed is is that once people decide, you know, I'm going to I'm going to face the problems. I am no longer going to be naive. I'm going to go out there and face problems. If you have that attitude, once you found a problem, you're done. Once you found something that looks bad and people said, "Here's something that, you know, here's something that's disruptive to LDS faith." And you found that and there you are facing it and you're having this experience of facing the terrible truth, you know. Then you're done. You've got what you're looking for. You've found it. On the other hand, if you're looking for answers and understanding, you're not done. You've just that's just the first step. And uh, like uh, Kuhn talks about how a lot of science is done with the, the process of puzzle solving. Is, is basic science is done. You have a paradigm, and you just want to understand. Okay, here's an observation that we don't know how to fit into our understanding of the world yet. This is where we work on it. And he says that to be able to do that. You have to live with this essential tension, is his, his phrase for it. You have to deal with the things that don't fit. But you do so with this idea that you're going to to make some reconciliation, to, to kind of come to an at one moment with it, in mm-hmm. that sense. And, and, you know, I think it is, you know, connected with what with what Jesus is talking about, with atonement. It's, it's bringing things together and, and incorporating all things into this one great whole. And that takes some more time, and it, it takes a willingness to change your your understanding and re-examine your own assumptions and take the beams out of your own eye and allow growth and change to happen rather than just you know stepping back and congratulating yourself for having the courage to face the unresolvable problem. Yeah. Now, of course, if someone resolves the problems, then they're just an apologist. You know, they're no longer a hero of the emancipated mind. They're just, you know, an apologist, and that's not as doesn't seem as heroic. So there's, there's there, there are things in the attitudes that affect how a person is actually going to conduct their investigation. You go through the article, and as you said before, it's not that you bullet point, you know, point for point everything that. Jeremy Runnels puts in his CES letter, but you do go down the row and and hit some of the the points, and you give some feedback, but it's done in respect with the 
the faults of how he approached his arguments. So we don't need to go into the details of each one of those, but perhaps you could kind of give a list, an overview of some of the topics that you address, and and then maybe we can focus in on one. Okay. Well, he starts his very first thing. It has to do with uh, errors in the book of, in the translation of the Book of Mormon, and so he zeroes in on on imperfection. And for me, at this point in my <laughs> writing, you know, I understand exactly what's happening there. Once you've decided, okay, I'm going to look for imperfections. The thing that makes imperfection important is an expectation of perfection. By definition, the, if the question is perfection. By definition, the only information that answers the question is imperfection. So then he's going to zero on imperfections, and he's done. All he has to do is point at them, and that's end of story. And uh, so what, I will do some things like saying, well, okay, what should I expect? Uh, what is a prophet? What is a translation? You know, and he doesn't de- even define translation, and I use the uh, 1828 definition from Webster's, and that turns out to take me into a different place. I look at, I notice since he's only focused on imperfection, he completely ignores all of the evidence that would suggest a different question. Is the translation of the Book of Mormon a real translation? Imperfections and all. Is there something real about it that suggests that it contains eyewitness details? Uh, that say, I do a part uh, going back into some of Margaret Barker's temple theology and showing how taking that understanding and comparing that with you know, a couple of the proof texts he offers and reading these passages in light of temple theology, which dates back to Jerusalem 600 B.C., and looking more closely at the Book of Mormon context for some of the passages he offers and see how this changes everything. And the meaning of the word sometimes changes because of a different context. And the surrounding context brings in things that are that have been there the whole time that he ignores. Because if you're just focusing on a proof text, stop, that's one thing. If you're reading for comprehensively for understanding and trying to expand the context, that's another thing. That's that's a mind expanding and making connections, right? Rather than just looking for an excuse to stop. So, what's the next one after he talks about translation errors or things like that? What 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 does he go on to next? Um, let's, well, he he goes through several things. I, I didn't bother to uh, to deal with uh, point for point things. Well, he he does some stuff with with the setting of the Book of Mormon, and one of the things there that I thought was really instructive when he says uh, his own expectations. You know, he he, he wants to have the New York Camorra. Then he also says that he tells you what he's looking for. He says, "I want to find something that compares to the Roman occupation of Britain and other countries." And here's a quote from him: "There are abundant evidences of their presence during the fourth, first 400 years, such as the villas, mosaic floors, public baths, armor, weapons, writings, art, pottery, and so on." Even the major road systems used today in some of these occupied countries were built by the Romans. You know, and he, and he talks about that. And he says, but, you know, well, the Romans showed up with several legions, and they stayed for a long time, and they brought government, and they kept trade, and they had, you know, this ongoing contact just across the English Channel from other Roman territories. So they have this, you know, going until 410 AD. And, uh, but that doesn't compare to Lehi showing up with, a, you know, an extended family in one boat. Right. And so the paradigm that he established for his comparison is misleading in the extreme. And then I compare that, say, with Brant Garner's approach, where he just says, instead of looking for uh, the, the Book of Mormon in Mesoamerica, how about looking for the Mesoamerica in the Book of Mormon? And he says that this, he made this, this shift that he describes, as he says, and Brant says, I have a hard time narrowing it to just one correlation. He says, the most important one is in the singular finding. Rather, it can be seen in the many facets of the discovery that the entire text of the Book of Mormon works better in a Mesoamerican context. Speeches have a context that makes them relevant instead of preachy. The pressures leading to wars are understandable. The wars themselves have an explanation for their peculiar features. All of these things happen within a single interpretive framework that puts them in the right place at the right time. So you've got these two different frameworks dealing with the same problem. And you can say, well, which one is better? And you compare what Brandt offers in his six-volume commentary and his book on, on the translation and other things that he's published through FAIR, Compare that with a few pages that you get from Reynolds, and there's really no comparison. Well, and that seems almost a little bit like a silly subject in some ways, because the Church has never come out with any official position on where the Book of Mormon took place. Yeah. So to fa- to find fault with the Church and its teachings is is it seems kind of like well the Church hasn't really said yet. So 
it's it seems like an extraneous kind of argument. Right. Well, yeah, but he refers a lot to he wants to have official things, official statements, and so if if it's unofficial, then it doesn't count. <laughs> and this this is this is sort of you know setting up your straw man because it's easier to knock down. Right. Deal, instead of dealing with the best arguments, you deal with the convenient arguments. Well, I I personally have been able to research some of these same subjects that you go into, and there's one in particular though that I wanted to go into and kind of give as a an example of how you approach these different subjects and understand that this is an example of what you can find throughout the entire article. The the one that I'm particularly interested in, because it's something that I'm researching myself on my own personal time, is the Book of Abraham and this idea that the Book of Abraham is a smoking gun. And Runnels has some very interesting uh, statements with regard to that. And I, I want to start off by giving his claim that you put in the article. It says, quote, of all the issues... The Book of Abraham is the issue that has both fascinated and disturbed me the most. It's the issue that I've spent the most time researching on because it offers a real insight into Joseph's modus operandi as well as Joseph's claim of being a translator. It is the smoking gun that has completely obliterated my testimony of Joseph Smith and his claims, end quote. Now that's a heavy indictment, right. but, but why is this statement in and of itself quite telling? as to what has gone into his research. Well, yeah, you just you just look at his research. <clears throat> and um, see, I I've, I've been interested in this stuff since I got back from my mission, you know, and, and I got back from England in uh, 1975 and I went down, you know, got back home and went down in the family room and there's a stack of old improvement errors in there and I start looking through these and I find keep finding more and more parts of Nibley's essays on uh, an approach to the Pearl of Great Price. There's a 29-part series it had been coming into my house for years. I hadn't lifted a finger to read them before, you know, so I felt like I'm ignoring all of this great information. Shortly after that, after I got home, then uh, Nibley publishes An Egyptian Endowment, which I bought and read. You know, I had actually read that book, <laughs> which <laughs> takes some effort. I went through the old BY Studies uh, articles and the dialogue articles on the top uh, on the topic, things that in Sunstone and things that have been published over the years in uh, in the Farms Review and various incarnations. And I got various books by different people that have their PhDs and these LDS Egyptologists. And so I've got all, all of this just because I've been trying to keep informed. You know, I don't consider myself a real you know scholar on Book of Abraham issues, but I've just tried to you know keep my eyes open, and I compare what I've done with what he says is his most crucial and time-consuming issue, and he's got six pages, and it's mostly just graphics pulled from a single anti-LDS site, and most of the critical information is attributed to unnamed Egyptologists. So when I'm looking at this, I'm thinking. I know a lot of stuff that he's not telling me. It's just this sense that I'm bringing a lot more to the table than he is. And it's just a matter of me just trying to, to have been informed over the years. And I know that some of the things that he really gets upset about, there's, you know, there were even articles published in, uh, like in the Ensign that, that Nibley did on uh, Reynolds is upset about what he, uh, Joseph Smith identifying the figures in Facts Only Three as, as uh, males, as Pharaoh and the Prince, when, you know, he says, well, that's half on Matt. Well, Nibley had talked about that in, uh, in the Ensign himself. And, you know, I quote Michael Rhodes uh, on some of this stuff, and I quote, uh, if we're con you know, it's a good example of to compare what Jeff Lindsay has done. Lindsay quotes Nibley's research in uh, Abraham and Egypt, where he goes through in specific and shows why, you know, the, the Egyptian court ritual in which they, they would dress, you know, the prince and, and Pharaoh could dress as as Hathor and as Matt because of their association with the authority that Pharaoh would claim. So that there's a going into the cultural background. It's it's not looking at it like a 19th century American or you know more typically nowadays it's a 21st century you know whoever person looking back at these things and saying well that's not what I expect you know getting out of our comfort zone and say well what what about the Egyptians or what about you know as as Kevin Barney would say well what about Jews and uh, you know during this period when the papyrus come from you know what would what would they do with this kind of material and that kind of contextualizing changes things so to put it in a perspective. At this point, let's just say the the one argument that he makes is that Joseph Smith makes a claim that a certain figure is a male, and Egyptologists are now saying that these were female figures. Bam! Joseph Smith's wrong. They've got the he's, yeah. he's got the gender wrong, and so. But where does the authority of 
these Egyptologists come from? Where are they drawing this from? Does does Jeremy Runnels even know, or is he just kind of as blindly taking that information as he accuses faithful Latter Day Saints of taking? Yeah, well, just about typically applies it all to just Egyptologists, and uh, there are three cases where he quotes somebody, and the quotes tend to be from the 1912 attacks on on the Book of Abraham. Those are the only three things that he quotes, and he, he doesn't really tell you who these men are and, and why what they said was important and whether anyone responded to that, or that there are any LDS Egyptologists, or he doesn't even, you know, he, he is for this identification thing, he just goes to Wikipedia. And, uh, you know, I quote from some articles that uh, Lindsay had done on his website dealing with these exact same issues, and, and Lindsay quotes uh, Nibley's book and several other things. And I didn't refer to him my essay that, you know, Lindsay has even more recently done an essay where he goes to Wikipedia and he uses other articles than that to show this practice of... Which uh, is hardly uh, exhaustive research. Right. It's, it's just the sense that that how much effort do you spend? You know, if this is the thing that troubled you most and you spent the most time on, he doesn't show his work. He shows other people's work and he uh, takes that at face value and, you know, uh, game over, end of story, you know, let's all pack up and go home and... That's it. But it, it seems to me that if, uh, you know, if I'm just basically an interested amateur and I'm just trying to, you know, keep my ear to the discussion, and I know thousands of pages of material that he's not even mentioning or dealing with or addressing, then, then I see that it's, it's, it's not the information that's really the problem. It's the persistence and, and you know, how much effort are you wanting to, to devote to defending your faith? And, and who do you ask? You know, do you just go to the antis and trust your case to the, you know, the objectivity of the prosecution? Uh, because after all, you know, since they're not apologists, they're, you can trust them. Right. <laughs> yeah, they're they're the honest ones, right? Yeah, they're the honest ones, and there's that there's that kind of assumption that they can be, uh, you know, uncritical of the critics and dismiss us just because, well, we're, they're apologists, and if they're an apologist, then you don't even have to examine. You know, their sources or their arguments or the material that they bring up, you just can just brush it off. Yeah. Because, you know, Egyptologists, you know, whoever they are, whichever ones. And we do have our critics, and we got, you know, a few of those are Egyptologists, but they're not the only game in town. And, uh, and there was some really interesting stuff going on with the Book of Abraham that if you're going to put all the information on the table, which he says that you should do, and I know this stuff is on the table. And one of the things that that affects, you know, whether I'm persuaded by something like this is because I know things they're not telling me. Yeah. It's important. It has to do with, in uh, the earliest English translation, say, of uh, the Testament, or uh, rather the Apocalypse of Abraham, uh, appeared in, in the Improvement Era. Yeah. And this, this was really surprising to find out because some LDS students had read this in German, and they realized, oh, this sounds a lot like... Uh, Abraham's vision of the pre-existence and the description of the facsimile and the interpretation, that's very interesting. Letter they Saints ought to be interested in that, so they did a translation and published it. And that's something that ought to be on the table, instead of just saying there's no reason to even take, you know, to, to even consider anything about the book of Abraham. It's all gibberish. Well, let's let's consider this uh, this story just a little bit longer, this idea of the book of Abraham is kind of a smoking gun. What what makes this issue more substantial for Runnels that that maybe is an insight into others who are kind of like him or who may be heading down that same path? What about this issue makes it so significant? Well, it's the expectations, I guess. The this supposed you know the, that uh, if Joseph Smith said that he he got these uh, this papyrus and that he translated it, and now Egyptologists can translate this papyrus, and they say, well, this has nothing to do with the Book of Abraham. But that, that's not the whole story. The whole story is, what about all of the papyrus? What about how Joseph Smith does translations? What about the situations where he's done translations like, uh, you know, the, the Book of Enoch, where he never had the manuscripts? And you know, what about the fact that when he did the Book of Mormon, you know, translation, everybody agrees that he wasn't looking at the Book of Mormon text? Does he have to be looking at the text when the way Joseph Smith's doing it? You know, when the one eyewitness to the translation of the Book of Abraham uh, describes it, he says that he saw Joseph Smith dictating it as he received it directly from heaven. 
Do we have the papyrus that Joseph Smith translated is an open question. If we look at what was going on, it's a lot more complicated than, they can, than uh, these people want to say it. They, they want to keep it nice and simple so that there can be, an, you know, open the door, shut it, and go home, and let's not talk about it anymore because, you know, Mormonism is expensive and inconvenient <laughs> and embarrassing, and it has all of these scandals that we don't want to be associated with. It's unpopular. But, yeah, it's unpopular. It's, it's like uh, once I did a, an essay of I, my previous essay, I used uh, brought in a metaphor I'd done of it's like uh, you're looking at a newlywed car, and it's all gaudily painted, and it's got these you know cams and and shoes you're dragging behind it like scandals, you know, and that's 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 the church, you know, it's got all of these graffiti and, and, and scandals banging from it to make noise. But the question is, is that car going to get me where I want to go? Not The question isn't, do I want to be seen in public in that thing? You know, so the question is, if I'm asking about the reality of Joseph Smith's efforts, that's a different question than the perfection or the popularity or whether it suits my personal ideals. It's, is Joseph Smith's inspiration real? Is there something going on here? You know, so I quote some of Rhodes' summarizing some of the cool things about the Book of Abraham, and I look at some of the things from, from Jeff Lentz. It's just a sampling to show what these people don't even deal with, that, that it's not an open and shut case, that maybe we don't have all the answers, but we have some really intriguing things going on here. Some compelling stuff. Yeah, it's, and it's, it's stuff that if, if you, you grab a hold of, we, we don't necessarily have the answer, but... It's this question that Alma asked in Alma 32. He says, is this not real? Does this not expand your mind? Does this not enlarge your soul? And it's reading those sorts of things are the things that give me hope so that I can deal with the unresolved issues. It's, you know, so that I can deal with what Thomas Kuhn calls the essential tension. And yeah, there's, there's tensions, but there's so much that's promising and exciting that's worth hanging on to and exploring further. And, and we've got such... You know, incredible scholars to, that are that are working on this now. That you know, I can stand on the shoulders of giants and wait. Sometimes, just wait a few years and see what kind of happens. Yeah. If if you were to give one or two pieces of advice for the individual who's perhaps approaching various gospel subjects, maybe facing the junction of heading towards either Runnell's conclusion or Lindsay conclusions, what what a piece of advice could you give? And and in a sense, why is that the best approach? Um, well, just to realize and say that I say in the essay that brittle things are far more prone to shattering than flexible things. And so to, to just to have a little flexibility, there's, there's uh, one of the, my favorite books is one called uh, Myths, Models, and Paradigms by Ian Barber. And uh, I, I quote this one in here where he's talking about verification and falsification in his book. And one of the, the statements is, the deduction is not confirmed experimentally. One can never be sure which one from among the many assumptions on which the deduction based was an error. A network of hypotheses and observations is always tested together. Any particular hypothesis can be maintained by rejecting or adjusting other auxiliary hypotheses. So just take a little flexibility. Think about your own thoughts sometimes. Think about, well, yeah, this, is, you know, this isn't what I expected, but what should I expect? Right. Take some time to step back and look at your own expectations and say, hmm, maybe things aren't the way I thought they were. Um, like, for example, on my mission, I decided, you know, I met people that were telling me Joseph Smith was a false prophet. And I thought, well, he seems obvious to me. How come they can't see it? So one of the things I started doing was collecting biblical scriptures that, would, that were tests for true and false prophets. And, you know, a few years ago for FAIR, I published this you know, essay on with 28 biblical tests for true and false prophets. Now, the two things about this are interesting to me. One is that, apparently, no one had ever done this before. <laughs> and the other thing was, anyone could have done it. You know, there's there's nothing special about me doing this. It's, it's just reading and, and, and putting together these texts. But nobody asked the question, because people think they know the answer already. Sometimes we have to ask... How much, you know, do we really know what we think we know? And uh, some of the things that helps us is and when we go on missions and we go into a different culture, it, it just rattles us a little bit, and we start to think, well, maybe things aren't the way they, you know, I always thought. And that sort of, I think we need to experience that sometimes, to just rattle our case. It's, uh, it's, you know, some people can jump in and drown. Well, 
I never drowned because I never jumped in the deep end without learning to swim first. And by the time I, you know, read things that were really seriously challenging, I'd read a lot of the apologetics, and I found that had prepared me. And if I just decided, well, I want to go out and face the problems, then I don't know. It may have been different. So in, in a way, you're almost making the assumption that, that Runnels perhaps was not sufficiently inoculated? Uh, definitely, yeah. He, it looks to me like he, he was extremely naive. And he says, how come nobody told me this stuff? And which is a pretty good question, but, you know, my answer is they probably didn't know, you know, because most people don't know. And if you assume that they're holding out on you, that's one thing. But if I'm assuming they probably didn't know, then there's nothing for me to resent. Yeah, you're not a victim. I'm not a victim. Yeah, it's just, this is just the way people are. People don't know this much. And I have certain understanding of the kind of people that, you know, say would thrive in an institutional environment and get a job working for CES and what their constraints and priorities are. And I say, yeah, I understand that. I can sympathize with that. But the church is bigger than that. The church is, you know, also includes, you know, Hugh Nibley and, and uh, Daniel Peterson and it includes Steve Ricks and John Tvednes and, you know, you know, people even like Eugene Feach, and there's even, uh, there's me, and there's Terrell Givens, and his wife, and uh, there's, uh, you know, just all sorts of things, you know, just, uh, there's some incredibly smart people out there in the church, and uh, one of the things that would excite me about the Farms Review is who they would get to review these books sometimes. Yeah. Uh, just, you know, the range of expertise out there, and it's it's something that's tremendously exciting to see who's out there and what they can teach me that I would never would have figured out by myself. Right. Well, I, I really appreciate you uh, coming on and, and sharing some of your upcoming article with us. And uh, I want to encourage people to look for it this coming Friday. I guess that would be, is that June 6th? June 6th, yeah. Um, so based on, of course, when you're getting a chance to listen to this, um, look for the article, Eye of the Beholder, Law of the Harvest by Kevin Christensen, found in The Interpreter. Uh, Again, thank you very much, Kevin, for being with us. Thank you for having me, Nick. Thank you for listening to this episode of Articles of Faith with your host, Nick Galletti. This has been a production of Fair Mormon. This and other podcasts are available at fairmormon.org. The opinions expressed in this podcast are not necessarily the views of Fair Mormon or The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Please subscribe to our show in iTunes. Questions or comments can be sent to podcast at fairmormon.org. Tune in each Monday for another episode of Articles of Faith. Thank you for listening.